Johnson. That guy's name was Anthony the Dream Johnson, the president of the fucking Manosphere. There's only one guy in the Manosphere, the president of the fucking 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 Manosphere. And that guy's name was Anthony the Dream Johnson, the president of the fucking Manosphere. There's only one guy in the Manosphere. My fellow Manosphereans, I'm Anthony Dream Johnson, founder and CEO of the 21 Convention, co-founder and CEO of the Redman Group, chairman of 21 Studios. Today I'm speaking to you because of the growing crisis of honor, integrity, and masculinity itself plaguing and holding back our community from true greatness. I'm directly referring to the recent controversy surrounding the actions of an author and self-proclaimed godfather of our community. The purpose of my words today are to review, bring clarity to, and summarize the real-life actions and choices of former speaker, business partner, and friend known to you as Rolla Tomasi. I make this video with a heavy heart, the reputation of my life's work on the chopping block, and with great hope and optimism for the future of this worldwide community of men and fathers. To begin, on June 2, 2019, Rolla Tomasi was confronted in a private 21 Convention speaker chat by several alumni speakers, including but not limited to George Bruno, Socrates, Alexander Cortez, Ivan Throne, and to the witness of many more. This confrontation focused on several related issues, including an incident from the 21 Convention in 2018 involving Rolla Tomasi and feminist New York Times reporter Nellie Bowles. The associated long-standing conspiracy to conceal the true nature of these events and related unethical conduct by Rolla Tomasi in his association with the 21 Convention, a self-declared silent partner. In response to the mounting evidence of this unethical conduct, in close counsel with top alumni speakers and consistent with our long-standing policy and terms, I chose to immediately remove Rolla Tomasi as a speaker from all future 21 convention events, as well as his regular involvement in the Redman Group show. Rolla worked to immediately write and publish a blog post that same day, titled 21 Convention Dates Cancellation. In this post, he announced his removal from all 21 convention events, encouraged attendees to seek refunds on their tickets, in contrast to our long-standing all-sales final policy, and stated then as a minority owner of the Redman Group company that the podcast itself would be dissolved and the channel disbanded. Statements that significantly damaged the Redman Group brand left thousands of fans in confusion and that Rolo had zero confirmation of or authority to make of any kind. On June 8, 2019, my company released a 15-page public statement providing facts, evidence, and detail on Rolo Tomasi's sudden removal from the 21 Convention and Red Mag Group brands. You can review this document in a link beneath this video at any time. Later revealed to the public by YouTuber and Red Mag Group panelist DDJ is that these actions by Rolla Tomasi were not isolated or accidental, but part of a larger pattern of behavior involving a failed coup on the Red Mag Group, and as revealed today, were part of the greatest conspiracy our community has ever seen. And Rolla's own documented language to burn down the whole of the Manosphere assassinate the legacy, credibility, and future of all 21 convention events, to conspire with other speakers to aggressively take over the Redman Group, and most importantly, use its function as a parallel speaker organization to build a new Manosphere Summit over the dead body of the 21 convention, the longest running, largest, and most powerful event the Manosphere has ever seen. 17 events across five countries over the past 13 years, hundreds of speakers, thousands of videos, enjoyed by millions around the world. This disgusting, effeminate conduct by Rolo and his allies amounts to more than the attempted murder of my life's work that began at, all, at 17 years old, but was an attempted coup in our entire community. In a word, treason. Let's pause and reflect now on a foundational principle that Rolo Tomasi is fond of repeating in his work for the Rational Mel series. Behavior is the only measure of, is the only true measure of motivation and intent. One more time, right from Rolla's blog, behavior is the only true measure of motivation and intent. I happen to agree, Rolo, so let's have a look at your behavior and see what comes up. This is Rolo Tomasi speaking at the 15th edition of the 21 Convention in October of 2018, giving his main presentation to over 200 men gathered from around the world to hear him and dozens of other speakers present their ideas on our platform. Man, how many people here right now are here 
And if your work found out about it, that you would be in trouble. Anybody? Hey, how many people here would, yeah, would you lose your, do you think you would lose your job? I think you probably would. I'd say, I, I already know that Goldman lost his job. Just two days later, Rolo would disobey a direct order from myself as CEO and the will of over 10 speakers who I counseled with on the issue of Nellie Bowles, a potentially hostile mainstream media reporter who could put the privacy, identity, and futures of our attendees at major risk, something we had promised in good faith to safeguard them from to the best of our ability, consistent with all 21 convention events. Seen here, Rolo Tomasi directly invited the New York Times reporter with a history of writing hit pieces on speakers like Dr. Jordan Peterson to a private social gathering for our attendees and speakers. He had been speaking with this woman for months in writing, and yet remained sitting during the entire encounter like, a, like the silent coward he is. Rolo would go on to deny any involvement in her appearance that night, both in writing and orally to the speakers numerous times, as well as myself. With every opportunity to take masculine responsibility, own his mistakes, apologize, and seek redemption, he chose to instead cover it up in a web of lies and misdirection for over eight months. He lied to my face, he lied in writing, and he lied by omission. He lied to my friends, my speakers, my brothers, my top customers, and more recently, over 40,000 of his own fans. Here are the faces of just some of the men, the men he lied to. George Bruno, Ed Lattimore, Donovan Sharp, Richard Cooper, Alan Roger Curry, Tanner Guzzi, Jack Donovan, Ivan Throne, Texas Dom, Jack Murphy, Hunter Drew, Socrates, Alexander J.A. Cortez, Goldman Unleashed, Elliot Hulse, Dr. Sean T. Smith, and more. Many of these men he claimed to be his own friends. Of even greater importance, they are thinkers and creators many thousands of you watching claim to care about, respect, and admire. Masculine leaders who have helped millions of men improve their lives as men, even helped save them from suicide. Here are over 200 men and fathers he pretended to want to help while secretly lying to them and stabbing them in the back. Men just like you, who trusted him to be a speaker, to be a leader, and above all, to be a man. In January of 2019, Richard Cooper and Rolo Tomasi, alumni speakers and co-founders of the Redman Group, will travel to Florida to visit me, sign paperwork for the Redman Group company, film podcasts and video trailers for both the 21 Convention and Redman Group, and engage in other business and recreational activity, including charter fishing with myself and new speaker Elliot Hulse, and training with professional firearms instructors. Everything was great, so it seemed. Within days of departing Florida, signed agreement for the Redman Group in hand, we launched tickets to the 21 Convention 2019 Special Patriarch Edition for Fathers. Suddenly, to the shock and confusion of thousands of fans, and after speaking multiple times and endorsing our event repeatedly, Richard Cooper suddenly withdrew from speaking and publicly attacked the safety and reputation of the 21 Convention event to over 170,000 of his own YouTube followers. He did so with exactly zero evidence presented of any kind. I soon responded to this nonsense from Richard Cooper that recklessly put the very question of physical safety at our live events in jeopardy. Smarter fans caught on immediately, realized the safety concerns were hollow and unfounded, that I was rightfully defending my event from defamatory statements that could cause real financial harm to the 21 convention, and that Richard Cooper's behavior was sudden, shady, and suspicious. Almost immediately, on February 6, 2019, Rolo Tomasi sent myself and Richard Cooper an email titled The Future of the Redman Group, stating, among other things, my first impulse is to disband RMG entirely, delete the channel. Further, Rolo went on demanding complete control of the Redman Group and all ownership interests transferred to him for free. And if this were not to happen, to dissolve the company entirely. Redman Group panelist and YouTuber DDJ has rightly characterized this as a failed hostile takeover and coup on the Redman Group as almost any first-year business student would. This is a business horror story right out of a magazine. Richard Cooper would eventually get cold feet and sell his ownership in the Redman Group to 21 Studios, giving me primary control of the company, contrary to Rolo's initial desire. We don't know exactly what went on between Rolo Tomasi and Richard Cooper in Florida. But Richard, if there was ever a time to take ownership of your mistakes like a man, something you frequently preach to your audience, now is the time to come clean and seek redemption. A sudden attack on the safety of the 21 convention with zero evidence and self-removal from speaking at the then upcoming Patriarch event was justifiably viewed by many fans as suspicious conduct, concealing secondary hidden motives. To do this in the middle of a brand new ticket launch to a live event where you are a featured speaker in the viral video trailer for it and to make such statements to a large friendly audience 
was absolutely damaging to sales for this event. For this to be immediately followed by another founder's aggressive, sudden attempt to take over the company is alarming at best and conspiratorial at worst. Rolla would go on to threaten to drop out of speaking at the 21 Convention Patriarch Edition to the witness of confirmed speakers. In addition, he made multiple attempts at alarming other confirmed speakers in regard to their safety at the event. To clarify, we had just lost a major speaker who then attacked the reputation and safety of the event to a large audience. Rollo followed up by also threatening to drop out on nothing more than a subjective feeling and uninformed opinion of his own safety. When your event depends on confirmed speakers showing up and speaking, when you have ticket holders counting on the event to take place, when you have signed hotel contracts with large penalties for cancellation, this is called sabotage. The question you need to ask yourself now is, why would Rollo do all this? Aggressive action to obtain control of the Redman Group, threats of deleting and dissolving the entire channel and company, if his extreme demands weren't met, all seemingly timed with a parallel attack on the 21 convention. It should be known before continuing that Rollo Tomasi and Richard Cooper are the top ticket sellers of all time to the 21 convention, and that our 2018 revenue was nearly triple that of 2017. But if the Redman Group is just a podcast show, why all the demands? Why risk damaging a relationship with myself and the 21 convention, a much larger platform, over a small web show? The answer is in the number one iron rule of Tomasi. Always control the frame, but resist giving the impression that you are. And in this endorsement statement from Rollo during his speech at the 21 convention in 2018, this off-the-cuff statement combined with his frequently stated need for a Red Pill Summit and the Manosphere reveals Rollo's true intentions. This statement contains a no-true-Scotsman logical fallacy, sets up a cult-like purity test for the Manosphere and Manosphere events, and most importantly, points to chronological thinking. A first implies a second. The only other speaker organization in the Manosphere is the Redman Group. The true purpose of controlling the Redman Group was never to own a small podcast show. It was to create the second real Red Pill Summit, the Redman Summit. Despite his best efforts detailed in a 15-page public statement, the 21 Convention was never controlled by Rollo, and therefore never in his frame. Additional statements surrounding this issue can be found in the extended email, The Future of the Redman Group, which will be released to the public and in the public interest along with the publication of this video. To review, during this attempted takeover, Rollo Tomasi was engaged in an ongoing conspiracy to conceal deceptions surrounding the Nellie Bowles incident from October, including lying by omission to new major speakers of the 21 Convention, such as Elliot Hulse. Dozens of speakers who associated their reputation and name with our event in good faith that other top speakers weren't bullshitting the organizer and trying to steal control of associated platforms that were and would continue to be a part of the 21 Convention experience. In the summer of 2019, Rollo would go on to resign from the Redman Group in disgrace, confess secret existing plans of abandoning the 21 Convention event, news to myself and all on my speakers. Based on the totality of these facts, it is my view that this was a slow motion attempted assassination of the 21 Convention and brand of events. If it burned down from a New York Times hit piece and our attendees thought themselves unsafe in attending for fear of losing their careers, so be it. If it needed to be defamed for unfounded, zero evidence physical safety concerns, so be it. If the Red Man Group needed to be aggressively taken over and weaponized into a new Red Pill Summit under Rollo's complete control, so be it. If Rollo needed to threaten to drop out of speaking and attempt to scare other speakers out of speaking on their own and attending, further destabilizing the event, so be it. If Rollo needed to work with other speakers to initiate a wave of chargeback disputes against the 21 Convention and on their tickets to the tune of over $40,000 in damages, in the middle of an international 21 convention in Poland, so be it. The 21 convention is more than an event, however. It is a central organizing force for the most important part of the Manosphere, the real world offline Manosphere, the preeminent event on the planet for our community, the heart and center, and the longest running in its history now for over 13 years. An attack on the 21 convention of this magnitude is an attack on the Manosphere itself. To my knowledge, there has never been a civil conspiracy of this scale in our community. To put at risk and attempt to cause catastrophic harm to multiple Manosphere organizations and real-life events. For many of you watching, this information is shocking, as it is directly conflicting and conflicts with the public nice guy persona of Rolo Tomasi, 
The Mr. Rogers Godfather hybrid personality he has crafted in the public space of the manosphere for years. The man who tells you like a broken record that he's not in it for the money, but will privately state that he's a get rich slow guy. To understand the role of Tomasi of the manosphere, we must look at the original character that inspired Rolo's choice of this name from the 1997 major motion picture LA Confidential, one of Rolo's favorite movies of all time. It should be noted that many Manosphere icons have unusual names like this. Mystery, Style, Socrates, Goldman Unleashed, and myself, Dream, just to name a few. Chosen names are not given names, however. They are chosen for various reasons by the individual. Consistent among these reasons, however, is that the name appeal to their core values in some way. They like the name enough to not only choose it, but retain it over many years, and intentionally be known by this name to millions of readers, fans, and viewers. In our community, Rolo is unique among top creators in that he picked the name of a secret villain, a police captain played by actor James Cromwell, celebrated as a small-time hero by his local commu community, while secretly being a murderous, backstabbing traitor to his brothers at the LAPD, and therefore the community as a whole. Actor Guy Pearce in LA Confidential explains the origin of Rolo Tomasi. Rolo Tomasi. Is there more to that, or am I supposed to guess? Rolo was a purse snatcher. My father ran into him off duty. And he shot my father six times and got away clean. No one even knew who he was. I just made the name up to give him some personality. What's your point? Rolo Tomasi's the reason I became a cop. I wanted to catch the guys who thought they could get away with it. Edmund, I want to have a word with you. We're trying to run down a lead on an associate of Vincennes. The records check has led to a dead end. What's the name? Rolo Tomasi. You ever heard Vincennes mention him? No, no, I haven't. Based on documented facts and evidence, sound like anyone you know? The truth is stranger than fiction in this case. The self-proclaimed godfather of the Manosphere has been secretly conspiring to undermine major organizations in our community, has been engaging in rampant, unethical, effeminate conduct, and has been demonstratedly been willing to burn down anyone and anything that gets in his way. Our speakers, multiple 21 convention events, the entire Red Man Group platform, and the trust of over 200 attendees he shook hands with. In his own language, burn down the whole of the Manosphere for more control and more fame, New York Times hit piece style. For those of you wondering why I've been so publicly angry, this is why, as any adult, sane, rational man would be, absolutely furious with such treasonous conduct that endangered my life's work. I make no apology for stating that Rolo Tomasi is the biggest fraud, sellout, and traitor our community has ever seen. A shadow gamma king pretending to be your online friend, father figure, and mentor to thousands of men. Men and fathers just like you, who live in the most anti-masculine age ever seen in American history. Men who need help, mentors, and authentic masculine leadership. Men and fathers who are under constant attack from mainstream media organizations, billion dollar brands like Gillette, and even including major professional organizations like the American Psychological Association. In the middle of the greatest feminist shitstorm ever seen, literally the worst timing imaginable, Rolo Tomasi betrays us all. Betrays the first ever emerging movement of men and fathers, organizing together for the interests of men, boys, and fathers everywhere. Shame on you, Rolo. You have brought dishonor to the entire manosphere and done more damage than any feminist could ever dream or hope to achieve. And now it's time to take out your trashy excuse for a soul. Because in the words of Hunter Drew, choices have consequences, Rolo. I have been a reluctant leader in our community for over 13 years, often tapping the leadership of older, wiser men to compensate for my youth. In some cases, this has been fantastic, as in the case of keynote speaker Socrates and chief patriarch Hunter Drew. In other cases, the results are mixed, as in the case of James Marshall. No bad blood, just a mutual bad fit long term. And in the case of Rolo, the result has been a nightmare. A fight for the survival and future of 21 convention events, my life's work, and the Red Man Group itself. 
This reluctance ends now. I grew up in this community and proudly call it my tribe and my home. And after building more live events at the highest level of quality and scale our community has ever seen, I am declaring myself president of the Manosphere effective immediately. And my first action as president is to permanently exile Rolla Tomasi from the Manosphere for the crime of treason. From this day forward, no media or news organization of any size should take anything Rolla Tomasi says as representative of our community. He is an outcast, a known traitor, and our community's first Benedict Arnold. You are the godfather of nothing, Rollo, and shall forever be remembered as the fraud father of the Manosphere. However, contrary to the title of this video, Rollo Tomasi will not be the Hillary Clinton of the Manosphere. Unlike Crooked Hillary, Rollo is not above the law. He and his co-conspirators will be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. There will be fire and fury, consequences for unforgivable actions and choices. To those of you stuck in a grieving process for the fraud father, that's what's going to help you get unstuck. Stuck in denial or rationalizations. Remember that the red pill, the essence of the red pill, is truth and reality. The essence of the blue pill is anti-reality, sweet lies used to control and manipulate you for benefit. In this sense, Rolo is much worse than a purple pill huckster. The Rolo pill is the ultimate blue pill of the manosphere. A deeply irrational man, if he can be called that, writing works titled The Rational Male who has decided and dedicated himself to stirring up drama and chaos behind the scenes, dumping it on others in public, and hiding the truth from you for months. In addition to lying of dozens of respected leaders, two dozens of respected leaders in our space. The red pill is often said to be a cold, harsh, bitter truth. And in this case, that will hold true for many of you. And yet the truth shall set you free from this traitor's web of lies and deception. For this community to survive and thrive, it must be held accountable to masculine standards of conduct. For exiles like Rolo, myself, you, and everyone. Rolo, I am ashamed of you. I'm ashamed that you ever allowed on my stage, and yet thankfully you did, as you have allowed me to show the world who you really are. I really hope that when you die someday of natural causes, that you burn in hell for all of eternity. You deserve worse. To everyone else, this has been Anthony Dream Johnson, your president of the Manosphere. Have a great day and I look forward to seeing you soon this October. Buzz Mix and Dick Stenzel. <laughs> so, uh, what does Exley make of all this? No, I haven't told him yet. I just came straight from the record. Table. Have you a valediction, boyo? Rollo. Tomasi. Hey everybody, this isn't a video I ever envisioned I would ever make or watch. But before we get started, let me remind everybody of the differences between the red pill and the blue pill. The red pill is the uncomfortable, often painful and ugly truth. The blue pill is living the comfortable lie. Why is this basic reminder important? Well, it's because as masculine men, it's imperative we cultivate the emotional and psychological fortitude to fortify us in order to accept the truth when it presents itself. 
no matter how brutal or painful that truth actually is. Many of us can sometimes suffer from confirmation bias. Nobody's immune. Red-pilled masculine men committed to ethics and integrity will recover from confirmation bias quicker than others and accept verifiable facts and observable reality for what they really are, the truth. Even so, we all know the truth is brutal. Often, the most painful experience in our life is discovering we've been lied to or betrayed by a loved one. Whether it's a lover, a spouse, a close friend, or even a trusted business partner. One of my sayings is, trust but verify, always. However, in the manosphere, often the takeaway for too many is that this only applies to women. It doesn't. It applies to everyone. Men, women, and of course, the manginas who cosplay as red-pilled men who are in fact purple-pilled power bottoms. By the way, here's a bit of a spoiler alert. Many people think those who only accept part of the truth are purple pillars. They're not. They're blue pillars in denial. This is because the worst kind of lie is a half-truth. Self-identified purple pillars measure their ethics in half-truths. Remember, a half a truth is still a full lie. Why is this important? It's because the manosphere has a betrayer in our midst who, in October 2018, put hundreds of men's lives in real danger. While he may not have always been this way, his betrayal at the 2018-21 convention forever branded him as a betrayer of masculine men. What's worse is that when he was confronted with the verifiable facts, like a dishonest woman, he refused to admit his betrayal and seek redemption. This is not the conduct of a red-pilled man. This is the conduct of a dishonest cosplayer looking to shill his personal brand of half-truths while cultivating fanatical fanboys to feed his fragile ego. So, what exactly am I talking about? Well, I think the fraud father of the manosphere, Rolo Tomasi, says it best. Let's listen to what he has to say. All right, yeah, the Good Man Project are basically what I call Vici males. If you don't know what the word Vici means, look up the Vici French from World War II. They are the French that collaborated with the Nazis when they took over, when they invaded their country. Okay, so when I say a Vici male, what I mean is I mean men who have sort of sold themselves out to the, fem the Gestalt feminine. So people, you know, it's a convenient term, but that's what I mean when I'm talking about that. These are the guys who are the male feminists who are going to eventually have Me Too allegations thrown at them. Okay, so we've heard it from him himself, Vici male. Also, I should probably let you know that Anthony Johnson shared with me the private communications between he and Rolo Tomasi so that I could look at the facts of this situation and analyze the truth for myself. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the private time-stamped communications between Rolo Tomasi and Anthony Johnson that I was able to verify. And this was in ASCII text format provided me via Twitter. So these are actually Twitter DMs. So Rolo Tomasi on October 3rd, 2018 at approximately 2.44 p.m. stated to Anthony, Remember the girl who interviewed me for the New York Times article about declining sperm count? First of all, doing a TRT story at last would love your help if you are still game. And I'd love to come out to the 21 convention, which is now so soon. Thinking it would be a great event to either write about or to meet people who have good future stories for me. Then he states, the gender situation and the general level of stress has only gotten more intense every month this year. It's amazing. Then he states, she says she'll fly out if she can get in. Now, what's the story that, that Rolo's talking about for the New York Times? It's this one here. The Dawning of Sperm Awareness by Nellie Bowles that was published on July 25th, 2018. So as you can see, Nellie Bowles has actually been talking to Rolo Tomasi since prior to July 25th of 2018. And apparently, she was at least talking with him about this particular article and maybe some things before that. Who knows? But you have to remember that Rolo is asking Anthony about this on the 3rd of October 2018. So that's what, three, two and a half, three months later, something like that? So then Nellie contacts Anthony on October 7th, 2018 and states, First, I should apologize. I should have reached out your way from the get-go. 
I'd been talking to Rollo and had written about his work before, so I was asking about the convention through him. In other words, Rollo is this feminist reporter's media contact within the manosphere. That, I think, should send up some warning signs, but we're going to move on. And this is an email to Anthony on the 9th, two days after her initial email on the 7th. And just following up, my editors are down for me just coming Monday, if that still works for you guys. Now remember, Monday is October 15th. So the convention, at least as I understand it, went from October 11th to October 14th. And she was coming down to speak to people at the convention on the 15th. Basically, as I understand it from what Anthony told me, is that she was going to be quarantined so she couldn't disrupt the convention itself. Now, with that said, Anthony publicly tweets, and this is on the 14th of October, the last day of the convention, looking forward to having Nellie Bowles from the New York Times talk with some of our 21 Con speakers tomorrow after the Red Man Group Live. Now, again, this confirms they were going to be meeting the Monday, October 15th. Now, the other side of this is, is that Rolo, during the convention, sent Anthony a text. This, I believe this is, I don't know, like iPhone communication or something. I don't mess with iCrap, but apparently they do. So whatever. It says, be sure you okay Nelly for Monday. She was hitting me up on my DM this morning. Okay. So apparently Nelly and Rolo are DMing each other either through text or through iPhone or whatever this messaging service is, whatever. Then Rolo asks Anthony on the night of October 13th, which is Saturday during the convention, should I invite Nelly to Sox party? And Anthony basically says no. Now, this is probably a joke, to be honest. I mean, I think he was just kind of being sarcastic here. So let's kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, in many things, Rolo seems to have opposable thumbs. So I don't think he was serious. But who knows? Maybe he was going to see how far he gets, you know? He was going to try his game on Anthony or something. But again, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and just assume he's joking. Just, you know, because the truth is damning enough. All right. So this right here is a screenshot from the 21 speaker chat. So the 21 convention speaker chat. And this is from Anthony Johnson. And this is the 14th, the last day of the convention at 1118 AM. And this can be verified by all the speakers if they choose to look at this Twitter chat. It's a private DM chat that the speakers were at for the 2018 21 convention. Anthony gave me access to it. Um, I signed an NDA, so I'm not disclosing any of the other information there. If I did, Anthony could sue me into the Stone Ages, but I have his permission to share this. It states, New York Times chick is allowed to show up tomorrow only, Monday, at 2 p.m. under tight supervision. She does not get the address until 1 p.m. Monday. Okay, so Anthony's keeping the information about the 21 convention completely compartmentalized. He's trying to protect the men who attended. He is trying to protect his speakers. And of course, he's trying to protect the venue. This makes perfect sense, and it is consistent with everything that's happened so far. Now, I haven't shown all the screenshots that I have. I haven't shown all the information I have, but everything I've seen so far basically confirms that Rolo approached Anthony to get Nellie Bowles into the convention. Initially, Anthony said no. And then he said, okay, after it's over, we can do a kind of a quarantine situation to protect everybody. And then this way she can't just party crash. Now, think about that for a moment. Now, on the night of the 14th, there was a social gathering after the event, and it was at a location in downtown Orlando. Rolo reaches out to Anthony via this text message at 9.39 p.m. on Sunday and says, where's the party? And then Anthony tells him. It's a, some kind of cigar bar, if you kind of see. Apparently, my uh, blackout game needs help. So there you go. But it was some kind of cigar bar someplace. So anyway, you'll know that it's a cigar bar because here is the private gathering right here. Okay. This is the video of it. And we just kind of bounce around a little bit. You can see her there. There's Nellie Bowles and people are like, you know, they're sitting outside. I don't know. Maybe it's something here, but there's, you know, people sitting here and they're, they're smoking. So maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a bar or something. There's Rich Cooper. So there he goes. He actually looks like a man. The transition's going pretty well. Anyway, um, there he is again. So, um, but yeah. Oh, and look, that looks like, is that Rolo? Is that Rolo? Look, he's, he's like, he's like sitting back, like trying to figure out the hell's happening. Interesting. So anyway, we move on and Anthony and Nellie had some conversation back and forth that culminates with Nellie saying, uh, genuinely, Anthony, someone in your group invited me and told me to come just now. I'm so sorry. It felt like I was crashing. 
That was in no way at all my intention. Then she goes on and states, I was invited to that evening session by Rollo. He said that five of the 21 Con guys wanted to meet and chat off the record before the next day's on-record interviews. I asked if he was sure. He said yes. I have all these DMs and have sent them to Anthony. After all this happened, and after Rollo docks the location and this unfortunate confrontation occurred, Anthony and 21 Convention put out a 15-page statement that included the video that I just showed and many of the texts that are here. I'm just going to kind of go through this real quick. There's some texts that are here. I'm just kind of scrolling through. That way you can kind of see this is on Scribd. This link will be in the description of the video. More text. Look at us. We're texting again. Lots of texts. And of course, you know, look, you can reward your curiosity if you want to buy Scribd because, you know, they got to shield themselves. But, you know, whatever. Um, and then we're going to move on. Now, the reason that this is important is because leftists have been attacking people for a while and it's been getting more and more violent. This is Jeremy Hambly. He runs the YouTube channel, The Quartering. This guy doesn't threaten anybody, ever. However, he was assaulted at a bar one night after Gen Con, after somebody found out who he was. He needed three people to pull off of his attacker. Now, to Jeremy's credit, um, I've actually met him. The man's six foot five. So when you need three people to pull somebody off of you when you're six foot five, you know that that guy is an absolute danger to your life. In addition to that, everybody remembers how Antifa brought in what appears to be possibly thousands of people to harass Milo at Berkeley. And then on top of that, somebody decided to load child porn on Alex Jones' computer and then try to blame him for it. Again, these are leftists. These are people trying to deplatform people, telling the truth. And even if I don't agree with everything Alex Jones says, I don't think that he should be the victim of this type of crime or any other crime. And then on top of that, Roosh V, back, I want to say this is 2000, yeah, 2015, Roosh V got stalked when he tried to come out with his neo-masculinity movement, and he got beer thrown in his face as a result. And then recently, since the 2016 election, Breitbart has recorded 639 cases of media-approved violence and harassment against Trump supporters. Let's call this what it is. This is national origin discrimination. This is terrorism. These are hate crimes committed by anti-American leftists. These are people who do not support the freedom of speech. These are people who do not support the Second Amendment. And they definitely don't support due process under the law. What they support is witch hunting and violence. Period. Now, the reason this is a concern is because Anthony is often seen with his trademark hat, Make Women Great Again. Now, prior to wearing this particular hat, Anthony used to wear the MAGA hat, Make America Great Again. Now, you can do a quick internet search and you can find that there are multiple instances of people wearing a hat that looks almost exactly like this who are the victims of unprovoked violence. And then on top of all that, remember last year when Tucker Carlson had his home under siege from Antifa? Well, this year, Antifa plastered posters around Washington, D.C. with Tucker Carlson's address as a warning after attacking his home last year. They practically broke his door down. They terrorized his wife and his children. Why? Because they didn't like the news he was reporting. So when you dox the confidential location of a male gathering, especially if it's a healthy red pill male gathering to a feminist journalist, or anybody else for that matter, you are putting those men in danger. So the problem with Vichy voices in the manosphere, like cosplay Tomasi, is that in their own narcissism and hubris, they justify betraying not only the men who follow them, but the men who considered them close and trusted friends. There is no worse sin than betrayal. When Rollo betrayed the trust and confidentiality of his fellow 21 convention speakers and the men who paid to attend that event, he actually put them in physical danger from feminist bigots, Antifa, and social justice warriors. Tomasi's betrayal could have gotten these men who trusted him fired from their jobs, destroyed their careers, subjected them to doxing, and caused them to be ostracized from their communities and their families alike. 
Tomasi's backdoor relationship with this feminist New York Times reporter put every man associated with the 2018-21 convention in harm's way. For her part, the New York Times reporter Nellie Bowles, from the evidence I've seen, at all times acted in good faith and extremely professionally, which is something I cannot say for Rolo Tomasi himself. However, as a feminist reporter who has a history of opposing masculine male teachings from strong male voices like Jordan P. Peterson, she could have brought Antifa or armed violent social justice warriors to bear. If that had happened, then the late night confrontation that Anthony recorded could have gone far differently. If this fraud father were half the red pilled man he cosplays, then he would have never put innocent men's lives in danger and would have immediately apologized to his fellow 21 convention speakers and the attendees publicly, as well as accepted complete responsibility for his conduct. Instead, Rollo and those around him have focused on defamation, lying, and attempting to conceal Rollo's unethical betrayal of those who trusted him. Remember, trust but verify always, and never, ever forgive anyone, man or woman, who refuses to accept responsibility for unethical conduct, especially when it puts innocent men's lives in danger. Were I Anthony Johnson, I'd sue Rollo and those around him into the Stone Ages for their efforts to destroy the Red Man Group, the 21 Convention, and their attempted character assassination of Anthony Johnson personally. I'm DDJ, and this Bukaki Chokeslam is your dose of misandry today. Hey everybody. So I can see that part one of this series created some major waves across the manosphere. Many Rolo fans were concerned, and some even accused me of creating drama. Let me address that, since this accusation seems to get leveled at everybody who calls out unethical conduct. Let me put this to bed once and for all. If you watched part one of this series, it's clear that I'm calling out a betrayer who is attempting to create drama, not creating drama myself. This betrayer, Rolo Tomasi, I verifiably demonstrated, secretly maintained a long-standing, secret, backdoor partnership with a feminist reporter who works for a news outlet that publishes articles promoting the hatred of healthy masculine men. This reporter herself even admits to having a standing relationship with Rolo Tomasi. I provided screenshots of emails and messages to that effect. Fun fact, when it's the truth, it's not defamation, slander, or libel. If Rolo wants to test me, let him try to sue me in court and let everybody watch me crucify him. You see, what's funny is that not a single detractor who attacked me for my video ever mentioned Rolo's backdoor feminist dealings. It's like they're so blue-pilled, they're afraid to even address it. By itself, Rolo's backdoor alliance with this New York Times feminist reporter is a betrayal to masculine men around the world. Today, far too many people are indoctrinated to be sheep, to be lambs led to the slaughter. If you look at some of the comments in my first video, You can see it in the tone and the content of the detractors. It's like one of the messages from the Matrix. Blue-pilled people are so comfortable living their lie, they cannot handle the truth. It hurts too much. They will even fight and die to protect their comfortable lie, just so they don't have to face the truth or any kind of verifiable facts for what they truly are. A long time ago, it used to be common knowledge that all evil people needed to do to succeed is for good men to stand by and do nothing. Today, that common wisdom seems to be all but forgotten among everybody, from boomers to Gen Z. So to the people that are upset because I called out Tomasi's betrayal and I exposed his secret alliance with a feminist New York Times reporter, I have the following questions. When the original Americans were unfairly discriminated against, 
Should our forefathers have just shut up and taken it? You know, bend over and just go with it? Or were they right to fight against the unethical conduct they were receiving? As every American should know, our forefathers stood against unethical conduct and fought to create the United States and our Constitution, which gives us not only our civil rights, but our entire way of life. Our country is the longest-running, most stable government in the modern world. When Hitler, Stalin, and Chairman Mao collectively murdered hundreds of millions of innocent people, should we have just shut up and accepted it? When illegal aliens, sponsored by corrupt left-wing bigots, victimize American families, should we just go with it? You know, let them sexually assault our mothers, our sisters, wives, and daughters? I mean, no one wants to be accused of creating drama, right? Well, what about the men who had women cheat on them? Should they just take it? You know, sit in the corner while your woman gets railed by her bull? Or maybe pay for his Uber back to his house once he's done with her? You know, buy him dinner and thank him for giving her an orgasm while you watched? I mean, if you're lucky, maybe you can eat their freshly baked cream pie for dessert, especially if you're the type of guy who can't handle conflict. Maybe this is the meal for you. Or maybe, just maybe, and you know, I know I'm going out on a limb here, but maybe you man the fuck up and you hold everybody accountable who disrespects or tries to victimize you and those you care about. But here's a reality check. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who whines when others take out the trash by falsely painting them as drama queens, what's really going on is that these detractors are admitting that the truth hurts. And their pain? It's unbearable. So remember that the next time you read a comment that accuses me or anyone else of creating drama when in actuality, all we're doing is just taking out the trash. Also, be especially suspect of any comment that is extremely negative, but refuses to address any of the issues contained in my videos on this or any other subject. This is because these commenters are often sock puppets attempting to derail the message with ad homs and logical fallacies in hopes of changing the conversation to avoid any real discussion about the damning, verifiable facts I've raised. Finally, and this is important, whether the commenter is falsely accusing me of drama or just making personal attacks while avoiding any credible criticism of the issues, this is blue pill behavior. Remember, red-pilled men and women address the truth, regardless of how painful it is. Blue pillars and purple pill power bottoms who cosplay as red pillars will do everything they can to avoid any real discussion of the verifiable facts, at all costs. Now, with that out of the way, it's time to continue to pull back the curtain and reveal some more of the verifiable facts surrounding Rolo Tomasi. Not only did Rolo maintain a backdoor secret alliance with a feminist New York Times reporter, but as you're about to find out, Rolo tried to take over the Red Man group and is actively trying to destroy the 21 convention. This is the Red Man Group LLC operating agreement. When Anthony set up the Red Man Group, he set it up as a business, as an LLC. And the partners originally in that LLC were Anthony Johnson, Richard Cooper, and Rolo Tomasi. Now, Rolo has actually signed his real name here, but I'm not going to dox him because I don't dox people. So there you go. Uh, and they signed this agreement on January 23rd, 2019, apparently at Anthony's home. Now, the reason I bring that up is that January 23rd, 2019 is an important date. Shortly thereafter that, on the 6th of February, less than a month later, approximately, I'd say two weeks, Rollo sent this email to Anthony Johnson and to Richard Cooper. Now, I'm not going to read the entire email, and I'm definitely not going to read the part where he whines about me and he gets angry about MGTOW because apparently Rolo's not capable of building bridges. He wants to keep the different tribes of the Manosphere apart. However, here's the part that I think that is extremely important, and I'm going to go ahead and read this because I think that it really gives us an insight into the mind of Rolo Tomasi. Number three, Rich doesn't trust Anthony. 
Anthony thinks Rich has overreacted. The end result is that this leaves RMG in a bad spot. My first impulse is to disband RMG entirely, delete the channel, and just deal with the fallout from the subscribers and the MGTOWs, who were only too eager to claim it a victory. Okay, well, first and foremost, um, wow, <laughs> you want to talk about narcissism? Rolo thinks he's going to disband RMG at this point, when the reality is, is that Anthony owns a third, Rich at this point owned a third, and he owned a third. So he thinks he's going to disband the channel and by himself, as though his third voting membership somehow gives him um, some kind of power. It doesn't, because he'd have to either have Anthony or Rich be a part of it. And at this point, it appears as though both were truly vested in keeping with RMG, despite some of the stuff that had happened. Um, in other words, DDJ, TFM, MGTOWs, incels, get what they wanted, they win. I even wrote that in my notes while the two of you were bickering. DDJ wins. Well, again, frankly, TFM doesn't give a shit about the RMG. He never did. And TFM's and my disagreement, we've both moved on from that, and we're both doing our own thing. MGTOW, they're going their own way. Incels, I don't give a shit what incels do. You know, it is what it is. But we're moving on. Uh, I don't want to do that. RMG has a lot of value, and a lot of people are in limbo about this thing because they care about it. I've spoken with Ryan, Donovan, Carl, and Hunter in private about a way forward. Hunter, in particular, needs to know what's going on because he's got the Patriarch show to host, as well as being a featured speaker at the 21Con in May. This shit reflects on him and his reputation as much as us. I don't have the liquid assets to buy out both of your interests in RMG, certainly not at forty to $50,000 that Anthony was suggesting. Ryan, Donovan, and Carl really want to keep this thing going, as do I, so I'm going to suggest the following. All right, let, let's stop here. This is virtue signaling, and I don't understand why Rollo is so narcissistic that he thinks he can speak for anybody. Ryan, Donovan, Carl, and Hunter, apparently, they're all red pill content creators, which means that, well, I don't think that their dick is in a purse. And I don't think that their spine is on layaway. If they have any concerns, they can approach Rich and Anthony and Rolo together. Rolo doesn't have to do any backdoor dealing with these people. And the fact that he's even trying to set these people up for a split by trying to pretend that Rolo, Donovan, and Carl, and Hunter are, are basically promoting this split, that's just unethical. It's unethical even if they agreed to do so. Because again, he's going behind the backs of Rich Cooper and he's going behind the backs of Anthony Johnson. Again, his business partners. I want you to remember that, okay? That's the kind of ethics that you're dealing with. A guy who's going to go and do backdoor dealings, not just with feminists from the New York Times, but he's going to do backdoor dealings with other red-pilled people to, drive, to try to drive a wedge through relationships within the red pill community. Okay. Rolo acts as though he's, he's an educator and he acts as though he wants to bring people together in public. That's a ruse. You can see right here from this email that he contacted Ryan, Donovan, Carl, Hunter, and probably other people in private to drive a wedge in their relationship between Anthony and them, and probably even Rich at some level as well. Now, we're going to move on. He wants them both to sign over interests in Red Man Group to allow me to run the show as I see fit, and according to what our regular panel members decide to do with it. Red Man Group becomes a separate entity apart from 21 Convention Studios, with the option to do live shows from the conventions if this is what the panel agrees to. Although I will have primary control of the Red Man Group, it will be treated as a co-op between myself, Ryan, Donovan, Hunter, and Carl. I know I read that in the wrong order, but get over it. Um, so basically, he's saying that he's going to completely control Red Man Group, so if Red Man Group doesn't want to do 21 conventions or studios, assuming that, um, gosh, the, the Rich and Anthony just give him the Red Man Group like it's some sort of fucking left wing welfare, you know, like feel sorry for Rolo. Rolo's pathetic. Give him Red Man Group for free because Rolo doesn't want to pay for it. That just sounds like welfare. Is that what is that? Is that like uh old person red pill reparations? I mean, what are we talking here? You know, does, uh, does, you know, the fraud father, is he trying to, to, to game Rich and, and Anthony to say, look, I know you guys are working hard here, but 
give me this shit for free because my name's Rolo and my narcissism requires it? I mean, what the fuck's going on here? All right? Now, we're going to continue on. Uh, it also separates RMG as a show being primarily about intersexual dynamics from any 21 conventions that Anthony may want to focus on strictly political themes in the coming two to three years. Well, you know what? Here's the thing, Rolo. Feminism is not only intersexual dynamics, but it is also political in nature. Feminism is an absolutely an ideology. And opposition of feminism cannot just be from man-to-man -man personal decision-making alone. There has to be political opposition because feminists lobby for legal changes in the law. They, they lobby the courts. They control the courts. So there has to be political themes if we are going to support men and stop the discrimination ag against men. We have to. There has to be some politics there. The fact that, that you're so limp-wristed that you can't handle the political piece tells everybody just how committed you are to the men in the manosphere, which, which we're going about to find out later is not at all. Now, we're going to move on. Uh, I, this is Rolo, will assume primary scheduling and topic creation for the channel. Okay, again, that's his narcissism. I want complete control. Give me control. And in this entire email, there's no money. Now, I would scroll down to the bottom where it says respectfully, but Rolo doxes himself, so I'm not going to dox him. Now, the other thing about this is, is that this is a chat group from Twitter that Rolo and his inner circle belong to called Rolo and Friends. And Anthony has a large number of posts from this secret group, which, by the way, uh, Rolo's OPSEC is lacking. All right. So Rolo says, uh, I told Pat I was going to call it with Anthony after October anyway. So in other words, Rolo was already planning on backing away from the 21 convention. He just wasn't going to speak there anymore. What it sounds like what he wanted to do is he wanted to do a hostile takeover of the Red Man group and then quit the 21 convention once he stole Anthony and Rich's platform from them. Then he goes on to state, I definitely want to do a new show with you guys. So yes, just consider us planning a new gig. We discussed this when Rich left, and I think I fucked up by not just cutting ties with Anthony then. So in other words, Rolo is planning this. And again, Rich left right around the time um, this email came out. And again, this email was uh, February 6th, uh, 2019. So probably, what, February, March, something like that. So he actually was talking right here. He admits that he and his inner circle were having these conversations about how to split how to take over the Red Man group, and kind of do their own thing. That's a problem. That's a problem, and it is a completely unethical. This is backdoor dealing. This is feminine behavior. This is not the behavior of a Red Pill man. Now, we're moving forward. He also states, Red Pill 101 is still going to be a show for sure. We can also bring Red Line under my roof or Donovan's with no problem. I just got off the phone with Pat, and we're cool. I actually felt worse about how I handled last Friday's caller than this shit. Well, yeah, because, you know, Rolo's a narcissist. He has no empathy for anybody. He just cosplays that shit. That's why you don't ever see him host his own shows very often. Or if he does, he's always got other people, unless he does kind of like expose sort of stuff that's like pre-canned speeches and that sort of thing. Now, they've created a new show. Uh, it, here it is. Um, it's, you know, Cuck Zero for Successful Female Strategies or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I read that wrong, but I think it's pretty close to what it was. Um, you know, and then there's a the new show announcement. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. We're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. All right. This is Ryan Stone. And he says, uh, sweet Rolo, if you don't have time for branding, let me know. I'll pick up the torch. And that's what happened. You know, Cuck Zero uh, for successful females that ran on Ryan Stone's channel right here. All right. So then he states, uh, I'm going to out and out an email about refunds and ask Anthony if he has any plans for that and probably take Rich's advice on parameters. Okay, uh, let's let's talk about the implications of that for just a second. But we're going to share some more facts before we dive into that. Here's another thing. This is from a forum, and I think I'll post the link of this. If I can find the link, I'll post the link for this forum. This is Ryan Stone again uh, at Iron Eyes. This would be a good time to give an example of how to properly discontinue a business arrangement. If anyone was fraudulently given the impression that Robo Tomasi would be a keynote speaker, it would be best to first contact the organizer and then escalate to payment processors, if not resolved to one satisfaction. This is Ryan Stone. 
following through on this where he's trying to push for refunds for the 21 convention. That's what they're talking about, okay? Now, this is Ryan Stone's email that he was talking about. This is like his email newsletter he does uh, for retards, or I don't know what the R stands for, but that's my guess. So here we go. So, and then of course, you know, there's the modest picture of them on this on the stage, uh, you know, and he talks about Rolo and the 21 convention. We're going to kind of skip down a little bit here. It says, send an email, this is number one, right here. Send an email to tickets at 21convention.com or contact at Beach Muscles directly about a refund. I have his affiliate payouts in my Stripe account. I assume being a businessman, he will reimburse you. And I'm ready and waiting for him to request the affiliate payments refunded on my end. Okay, so Ryan knows that there are no refunds for the 21 convention. And he's telling his entire email list to ask for a refund. That's bad faith. It is, well, we're going to go into what it is in a minute. Because Rolo did the same thing. Rolo, on June 2nd, talked about a you know, 21 convention dates cancellation. And he says, quote, This is a very unfortunate turn of events, since it means I will not be attending the Poland convention or the Orlando event. If you purchase the ticket through my affiliate link and you no longer wish to attend, you'll have to contact Anthony Johnson for a refund. All right? Now, he knows there's no refunds. The other thing is this. This Rolo and Friends looks like that Ryan Stone was coordinating with Rolo himself and at least Rich Cooper and probably other people. This looks like he followed through on that coordination and started executing on it. Not only did he send an email to his people about this, but Rolo sent it to his, I think it's like a half a million uh, subscribers or unique visits to his blog every month. Well, there's a definition for this. It's called tortious interference, also known as intentional interference with contractual relations. In the common law of torts, it occurs when one person intentionally damages someone else's contractual or business relationship with a third party causing economic harm. So let me give you an example. So you have some piece of shit who goes and tells people who purchase 21 convention tickets, you need to ask for a refund because Rolo's no longer speaking and I'm no longer speaking. So therefore you've been defrauded. Okay. That's the narrative that they're going with. That's what they've said. So that's tortious interference. They could be sued for that. Their marital communities can be held legally liable for that. So again, according to Cornell, at common law, a defendant is liable to pay damages in tort for actions intended to interfere with the plaintiff's contractual relations with a third party. In an intentional interference claim, the burden is on the plaintiff to prove the elements of the claim rather than the defendant to prove that its acts were justified. To prevail on the claim, the plaintiff must prove four elements. One, that a valid contract existed. Well, guess what, boys and girls? I did the homework. Verbal contracts in the state of Florida are valid. Lots of case law. Number two, that the defendant had knowledge of the contract. Well, at all times, Rich Cooper, Ryan Stone, and Rolo Tomasi had knowledge of the verbal contract. They were speakers at the event, and they were affiliates selling tickets. Number three, the defendant acted intentionally and improperly, which they did. They told people to start getting refunds and falsely claimed that there was a fraud being taken place because they were no longer speaking at the event. And number four, that the plaintiff was injured by the defendant's actions. Well, I can tell you this. I have seen many of the attempted chargebacks and many of the people who were requesting chargebacks have quoted Rolo and Rich and have said that both have attempted to request chargebacks, and that's the reason they're doing it, is because Rolo and Rich told them to. Guess what? That's intentional interference with a contractual relationship. Oh, and here's a handy piece of case law. United Truck Leasing Corp. versus Geltman from 1990. Now, everybody's been asking me, well, why would Rolo do this? Why, why would he do this? There's, there's no motive here, DDJ. Why would he do this? Rolo, he, he's, our, he's our Jesus. He's our Jesus Christ. He's the guy who jumps the fence to get to the promised land and mow our lawns. He's, he's the promised one. Well, what's going on there, brah? All right. 
Well, let me burst your bubble here, ladies. This is a text from Rollo Tomasi. Quote, Imagine how much money I could make if I said fuck it and threw the red pill and the whole manosphere under the bus. I could just unblock Nellie Bowles and play her like a fiddle, giving her confirmation of every ugly suspicion the mainstream media ever wanted to write about the red pill. We could do a major investigative documentary on the ugly misogynistic underbelly of the Nazis ethno-nationalists in the red pill and broadcast it on CNN. Then he goes on and he says, then I could completely renounce all things Red Pill and join forces with the likes of Dr. Babe Love and talk about how awesome women are, how misunderstood they are, and how to push for purple pill mutual understanding while spouting off some earthy woo-woo mysticism because it feels good and it builds my brand in positivity. And all these fuckwits would believe it. Now, you want to talk about motive? It's no more complex than greed. Period. That's always what it's been about. It's about Rolo building his brand. It's about Rolo being in control. He wanted to take control and have 100% of control of the Red Man group, and he tried to force Rich and Anthony out for nothing. You know, he wanted, I don't know, uh, old person grandpa reparations for being the grandfather or the fraud father or whatever of the manosphere. And then the entire time, he was working to backstab them. So let me reiterate. As you can see, Rolo, after less than two months of officially going into business with both Anthony Johnson and Rich Cooper, attempted a hostile takeover. He tried to force out both Anthony and Rich Cooper. While Rich eventually sold his interest in the Red Man Group LLC to Anthony Johnson, he made Anthony Johnson the majority shareholder. This is not what Rolo wanted. Rolo wanted exclusive control. His email that I showed in this video even admits it. Also, don't forget, Rolo admitted an email to working behind the scenes to persuade at least four other people close to Anthony to abandon him and to follow Rolo's lead instead. And two of them did. Carl and Ryan Stone. Even worse, Rolo, Ryan, and others in the Tomasi and Friends inner circle conspired to commit tortious interference against 21 Convention and Anthony Johnson by telling 21 Convention ticket holders to ask for refunds, even though at all times they knew or should have known that there are no refunds for Convention tickets. Not only does this put Tomasi and his marital community at risk for legal liability, but also puts Ryan Stone, Rich Cooper, and anyone else in the Tomasi and Friends inner circle and their marital communities, if any, in legal jeopardy also. Rollo acts like a nice guy in public, but it's all just an act. As you can see, behind the scenes, Rollo is a two-faced, greedy backstabber willing to sell out the entire manosphere just to make a buck. So let's recap for the back of the class. In part one, I exposed Rollo's long-standing secret backdoor relationship with a feminist New York Times reporter, Nellie Bowles. I also showed emails where Nellie Bowles herself admitted she only found out about the cigar bar because Rolo personally invited her to it, not because of any social media posts by anybody else. Then I showed how less than a month after Rolo officially joined the Red Man Group LLC as a partner, he attempted a hostile takeover. I also showed that while this was happening, Rolo was secretly working behind the scenes to get everyone associated with Anthony Johnson and the Red Man Group LLC to abandon those business relationships in favor of working with Rolo himself. If you check Ryan Stone's channel, you will see many former Red Man Group members now working with Rolo in his Cuck Zero show, which confirms the messages I reviewed in this video. Then I showed that Rolo, Rich Cooper, Ryan Stone, and others conspired to tortiously interfere with the 21 Convention defamed both the convention and Anthony Johnson personally, as well as contacted their fan bases in a wrongful effort to persuade them to request a refund of their tickets. Finally, I showed Rolo's willingness to sell out the entire manosphere just to make a buck. Anyone who still thinks Rolo is an ally to the manosphere or red pill truth is deeply mistaken. Rolo and his allies are enemies of red-pilled men everywhere. Red-pilled men do not backstab one another. 
That's a bitch move. Rolo and his friends are jealous of Anthony and everything he's built, and their gestalt feminine jealousy is driving their unethical conduct. And now the world can see these feminine backstabbers for who they really are. Were I Anthony Johnson, I would sue every one of these bitches into the Stone Ages for their feminist conspiracy to take down Anthony Johnson, the Red Man Group LLC, and the 21 Convention. And then I would salt the earth around them and make sure everyone knows that this is what happens to backstabbing betrayers of masculine men. As masculine men committed to red pill truths, we have enemies throughout the mainstream media and left wing social justice groups. And now, just like APOC from The Matrix, we now realize we have enemies in our midst, betrayers amongst us. The problem, which I've discussed before, is the red pill blind spot. We think that just because someone claims they're red pilled, that we take them at their word. We shouldn't. We should trust, but verify. Always. I'm DDJ, and this ongoing expose of the fraud father of the manosphere is your dose of misandry today. Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2019 of Warsaw, Poland, our fourth event in Europe. Our next speaker is a very close personal friend of mine, a guy who has saved my ass multiple times, and is a veteran speaker of this convention and the first ambassador in elite uh, category speakers we have. He started speaking at this conference back in 2011, a long time ago at this point. He's spoken in Texas, Florida, all over the world with us. More than that, though, he's one of the few speakers still around today that who has watched and seen the convention grow since before the first event. He saw me put this, the first convention together back in 2005, 2006, when this was going on. And he's here today in 2019 in Warsaw, Poland. Without further ado, please let me welcome from manningupsmart.com, Socrates. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to also sit down and say this, that I actually owe Anthony Johnson in this convention a very real, sincere uh, appreciation. I would not have the life that I do now, and in particularly the daughter that I have. And it has absolutely been life transformational. And particularly with where we both started out and that particular journey was a rather unique one. And I think it would be something that a lot of men, it resonates with them and it'd be a similar journey. I don't want you thinking it's terribly unique because you can all go through that process if you so and choose. My name is Socrates. And I help people navigate today's sexual marketplace. I help them improve their relationships, and I'm a strong vocal advocate for fatherhood and fathering. Interestingly enough, that has put me in a file of several groups. Feminists, for example, red pill men, and many of the red pill thought leaders and content creators loathe me. Why? It's fairly kind of obvious. I fundamentally believe that people are meant for each other, that men and women are naturally compatible and complementary to each other. But because of society, culture, sexual politics, and our sheer ignorance to our own human natural instincts and natural way of being 
has taken us seriously, seriously awry. I wanted to do something about that for myself and for others because I've received so much in kind. Europe, unlike the United States, is completely seeped into world history. It runs deep. Europe has created some of the most wondrous monuments to culture, value, and beliefs. They've survived over centuries and they're representative of their culture and beliefs and value systems. They're momentous. They speak to God. They speak to our humanity. Today, however, there are movements afoot to debase all this, to attack it, to attack Western civilization, to demean the achievements of Western civilization to demean the institutions that created, fostered, and supported the world we know today. It doesn't stop. It is not benign. Fortunately, for the most part, these antics are a front to nearly everyone. And because of it, it's terribly self-defeating. However, the normalization, the mainstreaming of feminism has set Western civilization afire. The institutions that served as the bedrock to our societies, our culture, and our beliefs are under attack. The Judeo-Christian model of morality, which has shaped our ethics and behavioral standards, the base unit of which has always been the family, has consistently come under attack. Unfortunately, members of the Manosphere, in their attempt to repair and restore order to our natural way of being, have unfortunately set the cathedral itself afire, unwittingly, unknowingly, and we need to go through a course correction before we burn it down. I should point out, the cathedral at Notre Dame was not set afire by feminism. It was alight and destroyed by arrogance, reckless management, and carelessness. So too in the Manosphere have those same actions been afoot. Recklessness, carelessness, gross mismanagement of the foundation principles of our imperatives, biological imperatives. We've mismanaged these, we've miscommunicated, we've misshared, we've miscultured and appropriated. And our cultures are suffering accordingly. The result is going to be catastrophic. And it really doesn't matter whether or not, was it feminism or red pill gone awry? Does it really matter? when the results are the same? There are those in the manosphere that rely solely and focus on the intent of a single sex, sexual preferences and imperatives. These are unjust evaluations. They're unfair. They're unbalanced. And because of it, you have derivative behavior that become deviant. They focus and sow discontent. They merchant in fear and traffic in anxiety. Rollo Tomasi was on a stage very similar to this in October. And he made the proclamation that the greatest threat to the manosphere will not come from feminism or for outside, outside the manosphere itself. It will originate internally within the organizations, within our own culture. I happen to believe him. And today, 
it will be the premise of my entire talk. We have a culture that sits down and notes, hypergamy doesn't care. All women are like that. This is what a gender war looks like. Of course it does. You're calling attention to it. You're not allowing us to find any other means or any other methods. Constantly keeping it on the mind. The focus may be hypergamy, but the message being received is to experience failure in advance without effort. The culmination is the debasement of our human nature to naturally couple, reproduce, raise our children, and relish in our grandchildren. Those aren't benign things. Individually, it's tragic. If it happened to you, or you, or you, it'd be a tragedy. But when it affects all of you, that becomes a societal problem. And that undermines the civilization which we know. It becomes cancerous. And that cancer needs to be eradicated. The re red pill community is becoming a cult based on superstitions. It is becoming incredibly credulous. That means it has a willingness to believe things that are beyond reason. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a cult of hypergamy, a cult that focuses in on a single sex, basic, natural, sexual imperative. It has a set of beliefs and behavioral patterns and practices associated with it that derive consequences from known situations that are pre-set up, presets that end up in terribly deviant behavior. You absconding from your biological imperative, which is a mandate, not a subset to this. It is also run by a cult of personality. And what do we talk about when we have cults of personality? What do we mean? We mean that there's a deity figure associated with an absolute, an individual that has unquestionable authority, okay? over that particular subject matter from which all this information and ideology flows. They are ideologically based and their focused and primary intent is upon that ideological purity. Who's red pill? Who's black pill? Who's blue pill? Who's in? What does it mean to be really red pill? Ideological purity. You also have these individuals cultivating mass media to propagandize themselves, to show themselves in heroic positions. You also have another element in which you have people that are taking sovereignty over the subject matter itself. So let's investigate some of this. When we talk about the sovereignty of the subject matter, who owns hypergamy? Who actually sits down and will honestly, to your face, tell you, I own that word. I've met that individual. That individual has also propagandized himself as a heroic figure. Imagine yourselves calling yourself the godfather of the red pill, the godfather of the manosphere. I find that intriguing, terribly intriguing. Uh, we were joking about it last night, and the reality is, for an individual who does not promote fatherhood, who does not exemplify that himself, who does not want to be shown as an example and promote that, why even have the term father in it? If you're going to do it, drop it. Just call yourself the god of the manosphere. It has a better ring to it. There, there's a lot more we can go in on that. Uh, I'm going to let, let, let this note slide on it. But the bottom line is we do have a cult personality associated with a cult of a belief, practices, 
belief values, and behavioral patterns that we expect, none of which are in alignment with your natural biological order. So what does the red pill teach us? Let's go through some ideas. First off, we know that hypergamy doesn't care, right? When mommy's upset, she will burn that house down. Women are ingrained arsonists. Half of marriages end up in divorce. And that, and that by the way, is a burning half building, half burnt down. You see the ruins of the already smoked out buildings. You see the ones that are on fire. And then uh, the people at the very bottom, yeah, nobody wants to live there, do they? And that's the point. Nobody does. We also know that what mommy doesn't burn down, the attorneys and courts, judges, they'll demolish the rest. And by the way, that figure spraying water, He's not to rescue anybody. That's not a firefighter. He's not a first responder. That's a white knight literally pissing on the ruins to keep the dust of this, this tragedy, this crisis, down to a minimum. That's a demolition crew. We are also left very clearly by the failures that came before us by the ruins and the wreckage and the scars of our own lives, of what could have been, what should have been. That was my home. My family used to live there. My children slept there. Harsh. For both men and women, Loneliness is being peddled, marketed, and sold as a virtue. For women, we have entire societies in which mothers have raised their daughters so poorly that they reject motherhood itself and celebrate their abortions. Picture that. A mother raising their own child so poorly that they reject motherhood and celebrate their abortions. Likewise, we have growing societies of men who are celebrating their own dysfunction in abstaining and detesting relationships, marriages, and families. What will become of this? How soon will we have until fathers are teaching their sons this? It's not enough that we're teaching each other this. Very soon, if not now, we will have fathers teaching their sons this. And what will not persist, what cannot persist, absolutely will not persist. This can't persist. This is a biological aberration. It's a cultural aberration. We know that loneliness develops deep psychological wounds. Stress, anxiety, fear, depression, substance abuse, suicide rates are all the highest amongst those socially isolated. As far as health markers are concerned, it's a carcinogen. It has the same health marker effects as smoking. Simple loneliness. And it is being marketed as a virtue. And the reality is, if it's that hazardous, shouldn't this come with a warning? Shouldn't feminism and deep red pill swallowing come with a warning that sits down and says swallowing this may be the hazardous to your health, happiness, and the legacy of your birthright? Hypergamy is no longer the theory that prevents men from making mistakes in their relationship choices. 
hypergamy, the theory of it, is no longer there for you to be aware, to understand women, so you can naturally respond to it. It is now shifted or expanded in the dialogue. It has become a theory that prevents men from taking risk inherent in leading and managing families, ensuring their genetic legacy survives. The theory is there to prevent you from even trying. Who are these men? These are dark and damaged men. These are men who are hurt. These are men who are neither loved by their mothers, who had maternal neglect, who were abandoned later, who weren't fully loved, or who maladaptedly formed relationships in which they were betrayed and hurt, and justifiably had emotional, visceral reactions to it. These are also men who have not learned and healed through the process. In parlance, they simply have not done the work. They have not looked at the mistakes of their lives and learned the lessons. They avoided doing the hard work, the heavy lifting, the consistent behavior that can supersede these actions. And we know these things can happen, good and bad. These are also men who will take tremendous pride in abusing you for your own good. Listen to the podcast, to the call-ins. How do they treat people who are hurt, who are seeking help, who are reaching out to other men? How do they respond? Ask yourselves, are these people you really want in your life? I'm going to go back to one. One of the lessons of the red pill and what they're selling isn't just fear, anxiety, stress. They package it very, very neatly. And they wrap it up in hypergamy. And hypergamy is awesome because now I have a reason. I can point to something. Hypergamy is at fault. Hypergamy is at blame. It's not what I did. It's hypergamy. The secondary part is Hypergamy doesn't care. You now have been relieved of any obligation. Isn't that nice? Massive life failures, and we can point to something outside of you, and we can place blame and squarely put it on there. The last bit of it, all women are like that. What does that effectively do? It relieves you from ever trying again. That's red pill magic. That's a lack of maturity. That's a lack of growth. That's a lack of understanding natural, biological, and human order. That's a lack of introspection, understanding. It's a lack of agency, acceptance, self-improvement. If you want to get past this, you have to do the work. You're going to have to look at yourselves, the decisions you made, your life events leading to that moment are going to have to come into scrutiny. We travel in the direction of our most dominant thoughts. Years ago, uh, in 2011, probably a little bit earlier, uh, I was given a book. Uh, it's called uh, Psycho, Psycho Cyber Synagogist, Maxwell Maltz. And at the time, it was a very antiquated book book. And the premise of it is about visioning. The things you think about, the directions, your visions, naturally will auto steer you to that goal. It leaves an impression in your mind and you start looking for it. In many cases, good and bad. And your mind can't tell the difference. So in the book, they focused on the positive natures. If you want success, if you want to succeed, the more clearly you can vision you succeeding, the more likely it is to occur. The behavioral traits that you'll take on will occur that way. If your constant vision is that women 
are out of control, can't control themselves, and their sexual biological nature is one in which either dominates or acquiesces, that there's a competition between the sexes, that we're not actually compatible, we're competitors. If that is your worldview, what's going to happen? It's very much like driving a car. You ever look off to the side of the road? Where are you going to end up? If you ever look at oncoming traffic thinking, I'm afraid of getting in a head-on collision, and you keep concentrating on it, you're going to run into that truck. Or in parlance, the train wreck that people just don't get over, who never saw it coming. And yes, I'm not belittling the fact. It is true. Women do have a sexual imperative. So do we. But we're only focusing on a single sex, not mutually. We're not also looking at how they have an obligation to control theirs, very much like we have an obligation to control us. But naturally, it is there for us to succeed. It is essential that it is there. It is essential to our evolution that it was there. It is a calling that we need to respond to. My biggest complaint about the red pill, it takes the tremendous, tremendous potential for each of us to be parents, to love our children, and strips us of that. The red pill in many ways is robbing men of their legacy. What's the point of saving a man from suicide if I end up doing it genetically and removing him from the gene pool? What's the point of taking a pistol out of a man's mouth if I allow him to hang himself in his legacy? Short-term thinking. Short-term thinking, short-term success. I honestly think it would be better appropriate to put the pistol back in his mouth. He won't infect others. He'll be a tragedy. He won't be a mass killer because he will affect others. We imprint. The laws of nature are unyielding. And it simply doesn't care. Any philosophy that puts relationships, marriage, and family anywhere but first in the social orders are inherently wrong flat wrong, wrong as to our human nature, wrong that it is inherently anti-thriving, and wrong in the fact that if it's continuously practiced, it will be self-exterminating. You need to know your purpose. You need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, because that will get you up in the morning. It won't be your debt, it won't be your wife, it won't be your children, but your purpose. And when you have a purpose, you'll do it intuitively, you'll do it naturally, you'll do it gleefully. And in this environment, there are very significant risks. They're legitimate. I've spoken about it in the past, others have as well. And where the risks are steep, you need to be smarter about it. But likewise, where the risks are high, so too are the rewards. Think of it this way. In today's society, in which we have 50% failure rates, in a world in which we think hypergamy reigns supreme, how glorious is it to have a happy, loving household and family that you love and cherish? How rich are you? Ultimately, I believe the sexes are meant for each other. Dirt does not replicate itself. It's a biological fact. You have almost sprung from complete nothingness. Simple, basic molecules. A sperm and an egg, so tiny you can't even see it. And from that, we have a f nuclear fusion. A nuclear reaction literally takes place and we've created life. It's actually miraculous. 
but we need each other biologically. It's an imperative. It simply cannot be done by on its own. Another one is our genetic inheritance. Overall, this picture exemplifies approximately 14 million years of evolution. Holistically, we're probably talking about three years, three billion years of evolution. And what we end up having here is this development. How do you look at this history of hominid development and sit down and say, I can't do it? I guarantee you, these guys had a hell of a lot harder than we did. All right? And, and it's, it's one thing to look at it. But it's also to sit down and say, this, there's some remarkable things that have happened here. That shift in the curve, something seriously was going on here. Because right now, we just have a gradual evolution. This is brain size o over time. It's the brain's, the, the body's getting bigger, we're eating more, we're becoming more successful in the environments we're having. But something dramatically changes. It's tool use. We also started collaborative behaviors. All right? We also started using fire. Dramatic uptake. And then we leaned into it. We really started doing some cool things. Early agriculture, herd tracking, all those sort of things. And what you end up with, way at the very top, is human sapiens. But you know what's really up there, in all honesty? Pierogies. Buttered dumplings deep fried. My god, somebody was getting that shit right. OK? Somebody knew what they were doing. And because of hypergamy, you're going to tell that whole lineage, 500,000 generations of history, of your legacy, you are the living end of it. I can't do it. It's too much. I can't get over myself. I can't get over hypergamy. I'm just not adequate. That's defeatism. These guys also had significant challenges. Human skull on the left, Neanderthal on the right. Uh, I'm sorry, human on the right, Neanderthal on the left. That guy on the left, and by the way, that's, that's relative proportional size. That's that scaled. That guy on the left, he's a monster. Crazy is we actually overlapped. We weren't always the most dominant apex predator on this planet. We had direct competition. And for several thousand years, that, that question wasn't answered. And we know it because of the pattern of which we find these individuals, the sequencing. And there were some articles recently written about how they found a first human farther north where they didn't anticipate older than the Neanderthals, which is interesting because it's a territorial thing. We also know that human migration patterns, when we moved out of certain areas, we went into their territory. I can guarantee you there was going to be conflict. Why do we know it's conflict? Because we didn't stay in their territories. In many cases, our migration patterns circumvent theirs. We flank it. We had to. And we evolved. We got better with our tools. We got better with our communications. And in another talk, I talk about the advantages that we had. But ultimately, we had some serious, serious competition. And it was no joke. It was life and death. You want real crazy? Hypergamy was here too. Hypergamy and a bigger, brawnier alpha. But you know what? Somebody in your evolutionary tree, repeatedly, again and again and again, his son and their son and their grandchildren and their grandchildren, they figured that shit out. But you can't. You can read, write, call somebody up. Internet, you can't figure it out. They did. Oh, it's not playing. Ah, uh, this is unfortunate. We're in Warsaw, Poland, and right here is the Uprising Memorial. Unfortunately, this is a fairly large spread. What we're looking at over a course of 63 days 
18,000 resistance leader individuals were ended up killed in armed conflict in World War II and it, with German siege. Close to 180,000 civilians were killed in the same conflict li living in this city. And that, by the way, had nothing to do with the Holocaust, which was more than 300,000 people in this very city, a city initially of 1.3 million that number of people were killed. After the conflict, when they capitulated, the Germans flattened this city, absolutely flattened it, building by building, civic structure by civic structure. It is absolutely remarkable. Carpet bombing wasn't enough. Artillery barragements were enough. They actually sent in combat engineers to take down empty buildings to give it as an example to the world. Warsaw was going to be an example. The Polish people were going to be an example. And you know what? They are. The remarkable thing is after the war, you had their good friends, the Russians, who, by the way, were sitting on the other side of the river while all this was taking place and they waited for the Germans to do their work so they can come in and have no resistance and the Polish people wouldn't have their independence. After the conflict, Germans are defeated, it gets even better. The resistance individuals who are still alive are accused of collaboration with the Germans and they're executed. How do these people get over it? And unfortunately, this video is actually supposed to show a skyscraper just behind this building itself. And it is monumentous. It is unbelievably gorgeous in comparison to what happened here. This is a culture who, after the war, survived socialism and communism, went through all that to then win their independence to be the city and the state that we know today. How do people do that? It's remarkable. You talk to Poles today about their families, about their culture, and they really don't understand the manosphere. I was talking to an old man, and he wants to know why an American would fly 5,000 miles to come to Warsaw to talk about men and the manosphere and our relationships with women, and he doesn't get it. And I understand why, because he lived through that. If you could survive that, women are a cakewalk, and they should be. Right. I'll also ask you this. Why can we look at this and think collectively that we've lost something? Why can we look at this and use this as an analogy of Western civilization, a monument to our ideas, our beliefs, our religions. Why can we look at this and feel like something's lost? But when we look at you as individuals going through the same thing, going down the same path, we don't have any care to the world. We ignore it. Why can we look at the manosphere and see this taking place and not recognize it for what it is? We need to do something about this. I go back to this, the original red pill. It's the idea of Adam and Eve, man and woman, the tree and fruit of knowledge, and either the serpent or a cherub. In this particular case, it's a cherub. And you have to ask yourself, it's not just between man and woman. There's always culture involved. Culture will always play out. We have a choice to be made. All right? And we have to ask ourselves, are we taking a fruit from a poisonous tree? Is that a serpent? Is it benevolent? Is it not? I'll say this too. I don't see skullduggery here, and I don't believe there was. I believe the real story here was one of free will. It wasn't just self-awareness and knowledge between good and evil. I think there was an honest choice being made here. That tree was placed in the middle of the garden and even for a reason. It was to tempt you. 
to give man the opportunity for free reign, for free choice, for free expression, to knowingly choose each other, to knowingly to defy God, to choose to be with a woman. What a remarkably different story. And fundamentally, I think we need to tell ourselves a different story. And when we tell ourselves a different story and we look at things objectively, when we put them in the framework of biological imperatives, not just sexual imperatives, and when we can answer those questions collectively within that umbrella of understanding, I think we come up with differing results. And when we consciously look for that visioning, we will naturally gravitate towards that. We will naturally have the successes. I'm not saying we aren't going to have failures. I'm not saying we aren't going to be challenging. They are going to be challenging. You are an apex predator of this planet. You're attempting to mate with one of your own kind, another apex predator. She's going to be complicated. So are you. But let's not make this any more difficult than it needs to be. Naturally, we are socialized beings. We're mammals. And that means a degree of socialization that when it's not present, we're seeing maladapted individuals. When children and puppies don't know how to play and frolic, there's something wrong. We know there's something wrong. When adults cannot do the same, we see a lack of conditioning. We see a lack of culturalization. Thomas Salt writes that an uncultured child rots. I think that's profound. I think it's also true for adults. I think it's true of men. An uncultured man festers. A man who's been hurt, who's been struck by hypergamy, a woman who's been struck by hypogamy, who doesn't do the work, who doesn't objectively reframe, understand, develop, and improve, who doesn't heal, festers. And for men, that's the essence of to uh, toxic masculinity. When you take on the viewpoint that one sex must dominate the other or exploit the other, least it be in the position of being compromised, that is a source of ugliness. A source of ugliness that is dramatically toxic to the individual and to the society in which he roams. And that's being sold. Right now, it's a bestseller. Inherently, we each know the road in which we're on. I implore you, look at your lives. Understand your biological imperatives. Understand your biological imperatives that supersede your sexual imperatives. Develop mastery. Develop intent. Make it art. Make it original. Make it yours. Ultimately, I implore you, choose admirably. Thank you. This, by the way, I have to sit down and say, was an absolute record. I came in under time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it, okay, I'll have to repeat. So if we have one at a time, somebody point, and I can take Q&A. None? I threw some bombs out there. Yeah, the question is, is, or the statement was that I talk about loneliness as being peddled as a virtue. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's being peddled as a virtue for both men and women. Uh, feminism in particular is looking at this idea, you know, that women are choosing their careers over family, over connections with loved ones. And, and I mean even immediate connections. I mean, it is not uncommon, like for example, even myself, I've moved away from my family. And so there's a divestment of, of a, a family unit. And you, know, you suffer accordingly. Uh, you also have people who are intentionally making long-term biological decisions, the ability to have children or not, based on these things, based on these virtues that a career is going to be more fulfilling, that it is more appropriate to actually go to work for a boss 
than it is to care for your husband, for your family, and for the household, or the, the family that you actually have, you know, whether it's parents, grandparents, or so forth. And these things are being marketed as a virtue, that these are positive traits, when in reality, we know people suffer uh, greatly psychologically, financially, sociologically, uh, throughout cause. Uh, and we know, for example, uh, you talk about divorce culture as well. Divorce is also promoted highly, in which case we also know that that has been tremendously detrimental to children in particular. It hasn't been particularly beneficial to women either. Uh, and, and we know that it hurts men. And, but we have a culture that promotes these sort of things, this isolation, the, this, this injuring of each other. And it's a replication of injury. And there's, uh, I, I meant to talk about it in my talk is that what doesn't get transformed gets transmitted. And when you have this being generated not only with individuals, they will teach that to their children. And so consequently, how hard is it to teach men to be good fathers who've never had a father in their life? And particularly while they're in the act of fathering. You know, in essence, how do you teach a man to father who's been underfathered while he's in the process of fathering? That's like getting on-demand training, okay, when you're on the job on something terribly, tr you know, technical and, and tricky and dynamic. And by the way, a child's going to be very, very responsive. It's incredibly challenging. And we're self-inducing this sort of behavior by the choices we make, by the choices we promote, by the room in which we give latitude for, by the restraints we remove from our institutions. We ha used to have institutions that used to protect and promote the family, used to safeguard it. I would love to go to a church today in America where I'm an, I'm an architect, and a lot of times the contractors will have, uh, we've had 102 days injury free. The next day will be 103 days injury free. That's fantastic. I'd love to see a church do the same thing. We've gone 200 days without a divorce. I mean, that would be impressive. I think I would actually go just to hear that. We're here to support the family, and we frown upon divorce, and we ostracize natural, which is, by the way, a very human trait. Deviant behavior should be ostracized. We don't do that. We promote it anymore. And in many cases, we talk about loneliness. It's just the icing on the cake. It's just a nice way of saying it, that we're promoting evil. Richard? Oh, Miguel? It's a kind of similar thing. Yeah, yeah, and actually one, uh, the, the question is, is about MGTOW, uh, and it's an acronym called Men Going Their Own Way. And it, in all honesty, it's a natural offshoot when you actually view life through a red pill lens, like when you can't trust relationships, when you can't trust women, when hypergamous is so rampant and women are feral. It would make sense, very naturally, to go to a higher biological imperative, which is self-protection, survival. And by the way, that is your primary uh, biological imperative, is to first survive. Your first imperative is survive. Your second is to reproduce, okay? But when your survival is at stake, Okay, because of courts, because of emotional issues, because of your children are going to be stripped from you, because half your assets are going to be seized, and everything else. You're, and, and by the way, men tend to get ostracized, and divorce impacts them in different ways than, they, and, than women. Okay? It is natural to go into a fight or fight confl in, in, in conflict, and divorce is fight or flight situation. And the problem with that is there's no amount of swaging that can take place when your hindbrain goes into that mode. Okay? It's not rational. You're not being rational. You've sunk down to your primordial self, and it is a response mechanism. And I think the rationality of all this is they take this and go, I'm going to protect myself. And there's logic to that. I can understand that. I can be compassionate about that. And what they end up doing is saying, I'm going to remove myself from the dating pool. I don't need women. I don't need this anymore. 
Okay? I, can, I can do a number of other things. I can navigate the world, but not be committed, not to have families, not to do the following things, not to engage in these kind of relationship-centric behaviors. And for some men, I understand why they do it. Okay? Men have a wall, too. We talk about women hitting a wall. Men do, too. Nobody wants to talk about that. There's a point in time in your life you shouldn't be having children. You can. Nature doesn't like it, and you know nature doesn't like it because of the birth defects associated with it, the health risks associated with your children. All right? we, we sit down and see that, but so they take this notion of a rational response, and they move it forward, and they guise themselves on it. And in very much in the same way I talked about in the presentation, hypergamy doesn't care. You can point to it. There's a rationality. Not only that, all women are like that. They probably don't have a justificational reason for actually trying. The problem is, is very much in, like in architecture, if I had my production design team come to me and say, hey, here's a set of plans, this is the concept and the design challenges we're facing, we're trying to solve the following problem, and this is our solution. And I could look at it, and I could say, great attempt, I understand what you're doing here, uh, you know, tell me about this, let's look at this, but the solution doesn't meet the overall objective which is the biological one of reproducing, of having families, of furthering the species, which is absolutely critical. You have to, otherwise we go extinct. And if we do it individually, that's not a problem, that's an outlier. But when we start doing it in mass, when we become lemmings, when it's affecting our nations because of the birth orders, the birth rates, we've got a real problem. When you have politicians saying, we have to take people from other countries and move them into ours, for replacement levels because we failed to recognize the value of our own culture, having children, and developing our own citizens with national identities. There's a problem there. There's a real problem there. And we're, fe we're seeing that now. This is sexual politics. All right? And MGTOW is promoting this by default. And, and the net result is going to be the same, whether it's feminism burning the house down or the manosphere, including MGTOW. Civilization will collapse, and what cannot endure won't endure. No. You mentioned uh, Red Pill is starting to turn into a cult. Of course, that's not the original intention of Red Pill. It was about seeing the truth for what it is. Correct. But I agree with you very much about it turning towards a cult. You know, isolating people, focus on negative emotions, uh, a focus on, on uh, doctrine and, you know, a structure of unflexible beliefs that can't adapt to, to reality. But that's exactly how feminism started. And I think it's, we're, we're maybe seeing a kind of cuttlefish strategy amongst certain people um, in the manosphere where they, they don't necessarily, um, they're not there necessarily for the benefit of other men, but for their own benefit while pretending to be something they're not. And I think it's very important that men understand how to avoid those kind of people, not just one of them or, or two of them or a group, but avoid that entire problem to begin with because it's, it's going to come up again. Yes, again. yes. And, and there, there is a profit incentive, uh, and I know that some people are incentivized by that, uh, and, and fear sells and sex sells, and when you have the two together, man, you are selling hotcakes on a cold day. Uh, and I, I will sit down and say I think there's a profit incentive, but I'll, 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 I'll be fair because I know a lot of these individuals or some of them. I don't think that was the sole reason. I think in many ways that they, they were hurt and they haven't gotten over it. I think it's their own personality types, and I think that in many ways it's a dialogue that we're not able to have because of personality types involved as well. You know, when we talk about a cult of personality, you can't question certain authorities uh, without it being an attack. You can't bring up uh, questions within an open forum without their followers attacking mindlessly, and we see a lot of that. And so I say that uh, the manosphere is becoming a cult. I would say a portion of it. There, it's, it's, you're seeing a division. You're seeing a separation of it. I'll also say this, too. Uh, with the personality types, and we talk about it being very feminist-like, I'll say it even goes further than feminism. I say it's, fe or, yeah, feminism as far as a philosophy. I'll say it's very feminist, that it actually has mothering qualities to it. Think about that one. You have grown men who are not cultivating men. They're mothering them. What does a mother do? It nurtures. It tells you you're okay the way you are. You're right. Don't, you don't need to change. You don't need to grow. You don't need to develop. Come here. 
come over here and suckle on the red pill tit. Okay? It's mother. Suckle, suckle on the red pill tit. Okay, and what happens when a mother does this? When a, when a young boy does not have access to a father? He doesn't develop. Right? And we're seeing that in men today with a lot of the red pill awareness and you know, red pill wisdom taking place is that they're being mothered, they're not being cultured. And this element of will culture you through abuse. No, you're just replicating your own abuse. And some people actually enjoy it. You know, you can always tell the shit posters and the guys who love snark, and I, I particularly hate it. I've grown to really to hate it. Initially, I thought it was kind of funny, humorous, but the reality is snark is negative, it's always tearing down. Snark never builds, snark never creates. It goes out to destroy, and it seeks it. And what you don't want is to have in your company a destroyer, okay? Because it will turn on you for nothing more than humor and pleasure, and we're seeing that play out as well. And unfortunately, social media is ripe with this, absolutely ripe with this. But I think that there is this movement of mothering men rather than cultivating them. And we cultivate not through abuse. We cultivate through empathy, understanding, through camaraderie, to shared experiences and failures. We do it through humor. We, th we do it by holding each other accountable without attacking, without demeaning, without humiliating. And I'm serious when you listen to some of these podcasts, here are people calling in with no other source for help or very little and being verbally abused. And they're profiting off that. And they take pride in it. And they'll tell you. I find that absolutely stunning. It's reprehensible. So what would be a strategy going forward, kind of like going back to like simply regarding the rest of it as a, a theory and then carving out the path with a different end in mind? Yeah. Hypergamy is real. It is a sexual imperative for women. Men have a, a sexual imperative as well, okay? And in many cases, you can say they're kind of at odds, okay? A woman wants to secure resources with a particular provider. A man wants kind of unlimited resources with a wide variety of women and tend to be young and, and variety. Okay, so how do you get that to work? And so the challenge is, as a man, I need to understand hypergamy and what it wants, and then I need to rise up and meet that as a challenge, okay? Women have the same obligation. They have to understand a man's hypogamous nature and answer it. And by the way, when you do, something really marvelously happens. It's, it's, a, it's truly kind of biblical. You respond with each other. And what happens is you end up thriving. You don't just exist, you thrive. You're with a woman who understands, who can care for you, who can nurture you, who satisfies you. You know, um, we were talking with uh, George Bruno, and there was something I said years back that resonated with him. When, when a woman makes you a sandwich, it, it fills your stomach. But in the process of making you that sandwich, she feeds your soul. Okay? That sandwich will satisfy you that afternoon. But what she fed you, well, you will carry that for weeks. Okay? And there's something tremendously powerful in doing that. So... Hypergamy is a calling. It's, it's not something to be feared. You have to watch it. You have to pay, pay attention to it. Same thing with men. Unchecked hypogamy has wreaked havoc across the centuries, across every institution and every culture and civilization we've had. Okay, and usually what you end up with is a stratification of elite that sexually monopolizes women and resources to the detriment to the greater population group. And every civilization has had that. And the way in which we know it, you look at harem context. Every culture's had harems one way or another. And typically, it's not only within our own culture, we go into war because we don't want to alienate our own. We have to go out and get more. And you'll see that taking place. So we know that unchecked hypogamy, uh, patriarchy, unchecked, can be a detrimental element. We know unchecked hypergamy can be the same thing. Uh, the problem is that it plays out typically different. And there's, uh, unfortunately, anthropological evidence that they don't typically succeed. They're not particularly successful. And there's kind of a red pill joke that they've risen to the level of mud huts, and that's as far as they get before they collapse. Uh, and that's, that's historically true as well. So I think what we need to understand our nature, our human nature, 
respond accordingly. We have to understand our society and context in which we live. I think being in the U.S. is going to be dramatically different than Poland. You know, we can see that. But you have to learn to adapt to, to both, that, that personal context, that human context. And ultimately, what you end up with is that at the end of the day, it's not that you have to respond to every woman. You end up focusing in on one. And it's not that you focus in on one. You find one that shares your purpose. When I sat down and said, you need to know your purpose, you need to partner with somebody that has the same pertinent purpose. Because if you don't, you're going to be pulling in opposite directions. You're just going to be a constant fight and control. You, you know, and I think in biblical studies, they talk about being mutually yoked. You know, workhorses, two workhorses paired together, yoked together, going in the same direction with the same purpose. You'll actually create and, and do a tremendous amount. You'll accomplish a great deal together. And so we look at those sort of analogies. And so I think it would be terribly important when we vet women is that we make sure that our purposes aren't in alignment. Because when they're not, the reason why we're together has actually fallen apart. And it's probably a good opportunity to sit down and divest at that point, is when that time and reason has, has expired. So is the relationship. Either it gets renegotiated, transformed, or th the departure is appropriate. So I'm trying to understand the, the idea of father, because you, you kind of like, the way I see it, you put it on, on, a, on a two different corners. On one uh, corner would be loneliness, which men are hurt, mm -hmm. they don't want to take responsibility. Um, and the, on the other side is the fatherhood, is uh, looking at our biology, looking at our evolution, looking at our lives as men. And I'm trying to get more notions uh, and put them together to the fatherhood to create a certain, like, a, a solid idea of like, how that I ideally would look like. Is there anything you could add? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, fatherhood isn't going to be perfect for everybody, and throwing people into fatherhood before they're ready is going to be a nightmare. Uh, I'll, but I'll also say this as, as a relatively new father myself, you are never going to be ready for fatherhood. Uh, you, it just, it, you just aren't. And, and I don't mean the daily task. You can learn the daily task. The consequential nature of it, that your job as a father is to raise a human being, to bring a child, and, and to, give, to give you an idea, my daughter's three and a half, and she's start, just now starting to become human. You know, she was a human baby, but she's now having to start to have traits that animals don't have. She can project forward, she's starting to think abstractly. And so my, our job is to develop and raise an individual through that whole maturation process to the point that they're a fully functional social being. Okay? And if you do that appropriately, the continuation of that is simply natural. You'll actually go out and find somebody, they'll couple, and you know couples are doing it right, you know, and communities are doing it right when they don't understand this. We have a speaker here that comes here on a regular basis, Tanner Guzzi. Uh, when I first came and I was talking about some of the stuff and having to reconstitute a culture, because if you don't come from a culture that has that, you need, to con you need to create one yourself or you're going to be at a deficit for it. And he's taking notes as I'm talking, going, yep, his culture provides that. Yep, my culture provides that. Yep, my culture provides that. And so he doesn't understand that. And, he, and he, I don't say he doesn't understand. I think there was awareness generated that some of us are facing different cultural situations than he does. And so what happens is when he's having situations in his culture, they don't have these problems because everyone's cultured and developed in the same way and they're acting and formulated appropriately. And when things are done appropriately, things work. A car that's been developed and designed, engineered, maintained, when you put the key in it and turn it, it goes on. Actually, you don't have to put the key in it anymore. You just turn the thing on. It works. And people should be the same way. And, and we've kind of forgotten a lot of this stuff. And where we go astray, we have to then recorrect. And so there's a correction process. And I think that's healthy. You know, um, and, and by the way, I don't think that there should be any one school of thought either. I think like a lot of religions, or I'll, I'll, let me take, take that one out because that, that one might be a little touchy. Um, let's talk architecture because I'm an architect. That there are different philosophies of architecture. There's this particular school or this particular school or this particular school. And when I was going through the programs that I was going through, the question is, is well, what's right? What's wrong? And the f response was, if you want to know what it's like to be a Buddhist, be a Buddhist, 
Okay, wear the garments, wear the clothes. If you want to know what it's like to be a modernist, be a modernist for a while. If you want to know what it's like to be a classical revivalism, go do that, embrace that. And so I think there's a lot of um, advice that, it's that the manuscript is now starting to develop and as, as we kind of progress from you know, Red Pill 101, which by the way, we talk about Red Pill just repeating itself. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. And after a while, it's the same information again and again and again. And I think we're seeing an emergence from that. And from that, I think it will be also very clear that we'll start having different philosophical ideas of how things should be or advisors or, you know, when we talk about gurus or in individuals that are content creators and thought leaders. I think it will be appropriate to try different things that you like and very much like your personal style, understand your natural archetype, who you're responding to and why, and dress accordingly. You know, and that goes back to Tanner Guzzi. And if you want to actually see a really interesting presentation, watch his presentation, not on personal style, on clothing, but instead of style of clothing, make it style of philosophy, of relationship advice, those sort of things, and see how those transferable ideas can actually resonate for you. And I think it's going to, his, his viewpoint on how style and masculinity are blended together, I think are absolutely outstanding. He's an, one, one for one, he's an outstanding speaker and just an awesome guy. And can't recommend that, those talks enough. And I think it's a great analogy to hold, is to sit down and say, understand your archetype, and then dress accordingly. Are we out on time? Thanks, guys.